Well, I think we're going to help you some on that tonight. So thank you guys all for introducing yourself. And obviously this is being recorded. It'll be going out to other people, I hope. And, uh, and it's something you will also be able to refer back to um, when you need it. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing these classes. So a little bit about myself. I've only been with Red One for about a year, but I've been licensed for 15 years. So I got my license in 2009. I cut my teeth on foreclosure and bank owned properties back when there were hundreds of them, literally hundreds of them sitting on the market. Um, I have personally transacted probably around 15 or 1600 deals in my career. And then I was also a principal broker of my own company for 10 years and supervised probably at least another thousand or 1500 deals. So I'm not uh, nearly as experienced as Mike or Ken because they've run such a big company, but I do have a tremendous amount of experience with the Columbus Board of Realtors contract. And so I'm here tonight to share with you the things I've learned, the things that are standard practice and um, just some tips along the way about how you can do a great job of helping your clients understand the contract. So uh, if you guys have questions, you, you, know, you can drop them in the chat. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on that, or maybe Malika can help me keep an eye on that. But, um, and then there's a few more people, I think, on the call that I can't see because it says we have nine participants, but I can only see this. Mark has this problem too. Let's see, who am I missing? Nine participants. I don't know. I can only see. I can still let me see. Oh, there's some more people. Lisa and Amabo. Hi, guys. If you want to introduce yourself, that's fine. If you just want to listen in, you can do that too. But we'll go ahead and get started. So first of all, I just want to say that the Columbus Board of Realtors contract is a very comprehensive contract. Obviously, you probably know it's been written by a team of attorneys. It's been revised over the years. When I was first an agent, I think it was eight or nine pages long. Now it's 14. That's because new things keep cropping up and they have to add stuff to the contract. Every time they add something, then it's, of course, your responsibility to go in there and figure out what in the world they're talking about and uh, try to make sense of it in your own head and make sense of it so you can explain it to your clients. The other thing about it is that even though this is a fill in the blank document, you need to be able to do more than just fill in the blank. You need to know more than just put the purchase price here and put the closing date here. You really need to be able to understand it and explain it to your clients, whether they're a buyer client or a seller client, they need to know what's in this contract before they put their signature on the bottom line. And I try to, I mean, I always do, go through the contract paragraph by paragraph with every client before they sign it. Doesn't matter if they're a buyer or a seller, unless they are an experienced purchaser that I've worked with recently, or I know they're an investor that's done a ton of deals and they know the contract as well or better than I do. But if it's a first time buyer or someone that hasn't purchased a home in at least five years or more, I'm going to set aside at least a whole hour to talk with them about this document before they sign it. And I do that for multiple reasons. The number one reason is I'm really big on education. Uh, Shauna, I was an educator for many years before I became an agent. And I just really feel strongly that someone who's educated is gonna have not only a better quality experience with you, but they're also going to have a uh, more successful transaction because they're going to know what to expect. They're going to know what's going to come up. They've been advised of the things that could happen, the trouble spots along the way, um, and they understand what they're doing. So as much as we just want people to blindly trust us, most people don't, and we really don't want people to, because that's too much liability on us for someone to just blindly trust us and sign where we say without them knowing what's in the contract. Even if they're okay with signing it, if they say, oh, I trust you, just whatever. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I appreciate that you trust me, but we're going through this contract paragraph by paragraph before you sign it. 
And uh, when, when we're done, they always appreciate it because even if they thought they knew what they were doing, they really didn't have a clue. Because as you, as someone mentioned earlier, it is, it's complicated. There's a lot to it. So you need to know it, understand it, and be able to explain it to your clients. Um, one thing that confused me when I first became an agent, and I didn't, I'll just tell you guys, I didn't have any training. I didn't have read one. I was working with a real estate agent who was a foreclosure specialist, and she was doing 40, 50 listings at a time, and I was her assistant. And all I did was watch her. I didn't get taught anything. But I was always confused about the terminology of an offer versus a contract. Maybe you guys aren't. Maybe I was just kind of naive and ditzy at the time. But um, I didn't understand that when it is only signed by a buyer, it's called an offer. When it is signed by all parties, it becomes a contract. So that's something that I didn't understand. And hopefully you guys do. It never made any sense to me why the name of the thing was a purchase contract if it wasn't a contract when I filled it out with my clients. Well, it's because it's called an offer. And um, when you're recording things in your files in dot loop, always try to make that distinction in your file names. So like, you know, this is offer one, two, three, easy street, or this is signed contract one, two, three, easy street and name it that way so that you can easily go back and know which iteration of the document it is, because you never want to send the wrong iteration of the document to anybody. And I've done that before and it cost me big time once tell you that story later. Um, but the CBR contract, as it is written, these 14 pages is very buyer beneficially written contract. In other words, it is heavily weighted to the favor of the buyer. There are some protections for the seller in there, but most of the protections in this contract are written to the favor of the buyer. So when you're a buyer's agent, you need to explain to your buyer, hey, these are the benefits to you in this contract. But when you're the listing agent, you need to explain to the seller, okay, these things are something you need to watch out for. This is something we need to be aware of or keep track of. Otherwise, we're going to lose our opportunity to terminate or renegotiate in a contract. So this contract mostly protects buyers um, and it is primarily a fill in the blank contract. And I will say that Pretty much every situation, every major situation you're going to run into commonly is covered somewhere in this contract already. In the fact that you don't have to typically write a whole bunch of extra stuff in a contract. Sometimes you will have to write some extra stuff. When you do have to write some extra stuff, never try to sound like an attorney. So this was written by an attorney. I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on television. I don't pretend to be one. But one way that agents can get themselves in trouble with the division is to act like you're a lawyer. Act like, you know, write big words and try to figure out what all these legal terms mean. So I've been told and taught that whenever you are writing anything like an additional terms and conditions of a contract, always write in very simple language. Seller will pay $12,000 towards buyer's closing costs. Done. Don't get all fancy. Don't get a bunch of uh, big words. Don't try to be legal and write legalese. Just write simply and it'll help keep you out of trouble because it'll be clear that you were the agent and you wrote it and you weren't trying to practice law. You were just trying to convey some information. If you run into a, con a complicated situation that you're just not comfortable with, it's not covered in any of the standard clauses that we're going to talk about and you don't know what to do, reach out to somebody in AMP, one of the brokers at Red One, myself, and say, I don't, my buyer wants to put this in the contract and I don't know how to write that. And it sounds complicated to me. What do I do? So ask for help. That's why we're here. Um, but whenever you are writing anything in the contract, keep it in simple language. Don't try to sound like an attorney. Okay. We're going to go ahead and start in this line by line, paragraph by paragraph. I'm expecting to maybe get through like page six or seven, and then we'll probably do contracts 102 at some future date, maybe this month or maybe early in next month, um, because there is just so much to cover. But one thing that's always helped me is I kind of developed for myself a script, if you will, of how I always explain things the same way all the time. 
That way I can remember what I said to people, even if it's been 2000 people ago that I talked to them, I probably said same thing that I said to somebody last week. And that's definitely helpful when people come back and say to you, oh, I didn't understand that, or you didn't tell me that. I'm like, you know what? I probably did <laughs> because I always do. And it kind of gives me a, a way to rebound to those uh, people that come back and claim I didn't tell them stuff. I said, well, I always tell people. And then, and so you, you will kind of develop a process of telling people about the contract too. And that's a good thing. So we're just going to start at the very top and hopefully you can all see my screen. I've got the Columbus board contract up here, and this is a sample contract that if you would like a copy of this sample contract, if you don't already have one, uh, it's an AMP product and we can get that to you. So if you are using dot loop, which I'm assuming most of you use dot loop most of the time, then the premises address will probably be auto filled in for you. If you auto filled it in dot loop, it should auto fill up on the top of every single page of the document. Um, now you always want to check because sometimes crazy things happen in dot loop and you'll end up with the wrong address up there or no address at all. So even though dot loop is supposed to do its job, that doesn't preclude you doing your job and making sure that this contract is correct before you send it out. So then we scroll on down and we're, we got the date on there. Don't forget that because a lot of times that date is like a uh, connection point for people will refer to the contract, contract dated June 1, 2023 or whatever. So always make sure the date is on there. Uh, again, you might have auto-populated the Franklin County or the parcel number might be auto-populated if you put all that in dot loop. If you did not, you will just have to type it in there. And the next section here, you can put either the legal description, which honestly most people don't do, or you can put the property address. I usually put the property address like 123 Easy Street, and then I'll put a comma, and then I'll put uh, being a three bedroom, two bath house on one acre. And that way you are describing the property in more than one way. And one thing that helps to do is if you happen to get the wrong address on there and the house your person is offering on is a four bedroom, one bath house on a city lot and you wrote a three bedroom, two bath house on one acre, somebody's going to probably spot that as a red flag and say, hey, wait a minute, is this actually the right contract? Because if you got the property address wrong, what if you got the price wrong? What if you got the terms wrong? So it's just kind of a double check. The same thing in down in the purchase price in line one, purchase price shall be $250,000 and then write that out in words in parentheses. Again, it's just to double check. And I've actually had situations where, you know, I made an offer and then it just died on the vine. They never responded or whatever. A week later, the seller buyer says, let's make a better offer. And I'll go in and make it $260,000, but then I forget to change this 50 to 60 well, someone along the way is going to catch that. Hopefully, maybe the title company, maybe my admin is going to catch that issue and say, hey, wait a minute, what is the proper number here? So having it in numbers and in words is like a double check. It's like a checks and balances to make sure you've got it correct. The next section is the additional terms and conditions. And um, I don't know if any of you have taken a look at the standard purchase contract clauses document, which is on Red One Agent and the resources. It's also on Dot Loop and the Columbus Board interactive documents. So, can you guys indicate to me, you know, give me some sort of heads up, thumbs up, something? Um, is something in the chat if you have actually seen that document called standard purchase contract clauses? Any response? Joe has seen it. Malika's seen it. Oh, I like that hand. Good. Anybody else? Nor Nara has seen it. All right. So if you have not seen this document, you need to find it. Um, uh, Sean has seen it. Okay. So maybe about at least half of you have seen it for sure. So I actually have it up. Let's see. You should be able to see. Can you guys see that standard clauses related? Okay. Joe says yes. Thank you, Joe. You're about the only face I can see, Joe. So I'm counting on the man. <laughs> keep, keep me straight here. Try so this is like, 
<laughs> this is like a seven page document and it has standard clauses in here. So you need to look through those. So here are uh, closing costs, for example, is probably the most common one you'll use. Seller agrees to pay a closing up to a maximum of blank of buyer's allowable closing costs. Or there's different ways to write it. Seller to pay buyer's closing costs shall include, but not be limited to. You can limit list all of these out. Um, you know, I don't really know that one is better than the other, but you do need to somehow specify that it's being used for closing costs. I kind of have a shortened version of 100B and I would always say seller to pay up to $1,200 of buyer's closing costs, points or prepaid items. Points being uh, discount points that you can use to buy down your interest rate. Prepaid items being like a year of insurance paid in advance or um, could be a tax credit. So those that's what I always do. So that's the first one. That is probably the most common one that you will use. And, you know, once you get familiar with that verbiage, you'll probably be able to just type it in there without looking it up every time. But that's just one. So there's release from prior contract clause. So in other words, acceptance is contract contingent upon seller getting released from a prior contract. So in other words, your seller's in contract with somebody and you heard that they're going to fall out. So you send your offer over. But your offer doesn't go into effect until the other offer gets released or terminated. So this is where you would put that in there to protect your buyer's opportunity to purchase that property, but not have to wait until it is actually released because then someone else could jump in and do this and then you would lose it. Um, if the agent or broker is acting as a principal, so if you're buying or selling your own property, you have to put that in there. Um, there's two different ways to do that. If you're submitting a backup or a secondary offer, so the house your client wanted when in contract, you ask them, is our offer good enough for a backup offer? And if they say yes, then you would use this clause and we can obviously get into more details when you need it. You would use this clause to put in the contract to state that you're the backup offer and you're just gonna wait to see if that other offer goes through or not. Uh, multiple offers, here's another one. It's a request for highest and best. There's a loan assumption clause in here. There's a seller to find suitable housing clause. There's a sale of existing home sale clause, which is another one you'll probably use a lot. Um, there's an investment per property purchase clause, an appraisal gap clause, escalation clause, seller's occupancy after closing clause, non-refundable deposit clause, and the list goes on. We could spend a lot of time there, but we can actually maybe have another class on all these different clauses and when and how to use them. But I just want you to be aware <clears throat> that if you've got a situation and it's not already covered in the main contract, it's probably covered in one of these clauses. So check it out and see or ask somebody for help. Okay, I'm flipping back over here. So the most common ones that go in additional terms would be uh, seller to pay buyers, closing costs, uh, earnest money, buyers buying as is, there's an escalation addendum, there's an appraisal gap, there's a home sale contingency are probably the most common ones that you'll put in additional terms and conditions. So make sure you flip over to that other clause paper and figure out how to write them or ask for help. All right, we're finally done with the first paragraph. All right, the second paragraph is an attorney approval clause. So this is you always want to ask your buyer or your seller if they want to put an attorney approval clause in the contract. Honestly, most people don't because they realize that this has been written by attorneys. And if you're doing a good job of explaining it, they'll feel comfortable with it. But anytime they want to uh, have an attorney look at the, at the contract, they can. And so you would just put a number in there. Usually three or five is pretty common. Um, and that would, after your client signs it, they can hand it off to their attorney and the attorney would have three days to either disapprove it or propose some changes to it. Then you have another three days to negotiate those changes. But always ask your client if they would like an attorney approval clause and then follow their instructions. Okay, the financing section is something that a lot of times gets people catched up. So section three, there's 3.1 and there's 3.2 and they're split across two pages, page one and page two, which I think adds to a lot of the confusion. Um, I think if it was all on the same page, it would be easier for people to understand, but because it's split, I think it's more challenging. 
So the first one there on 3.1 is only for if your buyer is paying with cash. So if your buyer is getting any kind of loan, you will completely skip 3.1 and those signature blocks, those initial blocks right there will be completely empty. But 3.1 and 3.2 go together. So if they, if they are buying with cash, they would initial, if there's like two buyers, if there's one buyer, one block, two buyers, two blocks, you probably know that, they will pay the purchase price in cash at closing. Paragraph 3.2 does not apply. So it just referred to this and saying this whole thing does not apply. Actually, this whole thing, all the way down to the bottom of this page, bottom of page two. So basically, if they are going to initial on 3.1, this entire page becomes non-applicable to the contract. Hi, Justin. Checking up on me. <laughs> hey, Gina. Just came to learn about the purchase contract. Oh, because you probably need it, man. All right. We're having a good time. So, yes, if you are having someone buying with cash, they would initial section 3.1. And the entire page two of the contract does not even apply. So you need to you know, make sure that they understand that and you can pretty much just skip all those terms. So that means that if you have someone buying with cash, you should always get the proof of funds. So the difference between a pre-approval and a proof of funds, if you're not aware of this, a pre-approval comes from a lender saying that they are uh, pre-approving you as a buyer to purchase this house. They think your credit is good. They think your debt to income is good. They think your jobs are stable. They feel like you'll be able to get a loan for this house. That's what a pre-approval does. With cash, you would have, instead of a pre-approval letter, you would have a proof of funds. So proof of funds might consist of a bank statement, which if you get a bank statement, feel free to black out the bank account numbers for your client's privacy. You can also have your client's banker write a letter saying, you know, so-and-so has enough funds available to purchase this property or to purchase a property at $250,000, uh, just ask for a proof of funds letter. Sometimes a proof of funds letter might be an equity line that shows you have credit available. Sometimes uh, proof of funds might actually be in the form of a settlement statement coming from another purchase. So I just had a deal like that where I had a cash buyer, but they didn't have the cash yet because they were selling a house in Florida and the cash was coming from that sale. So I requested that they send me a copy of the settlement statement. And um, then I verified with everybody down there in Florida that this was actually happening because I was the only proof of funds I had. Thankfully, I was uh, friends already with this agent. I trusted her. I knew she had vetted her client properly and I was confident going ahead. Sometimes you might feel a little uncomfortable in that situation, uh, but do everything you can to vet that for your client and let them know the situation. So it did work out well. She closed her house in Florida. It was already past inspections. It was past appraisal. Uh, they were just basically waiting to close. They were only like 10 days out. They closed it. The money was wired here. And then she had the cash, paid my clients, and it was done. So it worked out great. So that's for a cash purchase. Now in the second part here and all of page two, you have contingent upon buyer obtaining finance for the purchase of the property. So that would be any kind of loan that they are obtaining for the property. They would initial the section 3.2 that says this contract is contingent. A lot of agents miss those boxes right there and they jump straight down here to 3.2a and they just start putting initials. Don't miss this. If you miss that, then technically your contract's not contingent upon buyer obtaining financing. Make sure that your clients initial that. Another thing I will tell you that sometimes in dot loop, depending upon what template you're using, dot loop will, or somebody set up a template to actually have more than one of these uh, initialed by your buyer. So your buyer could initial this one or they could initial this one. You probably want to go in and unselect the one that you don't want them to sign because you don't want it to get confusing for them. It's confusing enough for you. So the contract contingent upon the buyer obtaining financing, and then they have to say whether or not they're including the pre-qualification or pre-approval letter. So right here, it says buyer 
has delivered or blank will deliver shall deliver within blank calendar days the number after date of acceptance to the seller a lender's pre-qualification letter so this sentence right here is a lot of insertions in what is really a very simple sentence so basically you're saying buyers sending a letter or they're going to send a letter, sending a letter now, or they're going to send a letter later. That's basically what you're saying, what's being asked. So you're gonna to have to initial whichever is applicable. Buyer has delivered along with the offer, their pre-approval letter, or they shall deliver within a certain number of calendar days, the pre-approval letter to the listing agent and the seller. Now in this market, as competitive as things are, I really don't ever recommend sending an offer without a pre-approval letter attached or proof of funds if you're doing cash. The reason being, if there are multiple offers and everyone else has their pre-approval letter or their proof of funds and your offer doesn't, how seriously do you think your offer is going to be taken? Uh, I had a property I sold in Hilliard a year or so ago, and I had 11 offers in like 26 hours or something crazy like that. And two of them didn't have a letter of any kind with them. They were both financed. They both had uh, no letter, no pre-approval letter with it. I gave the, the buyer's agent one chance. I sent one email and I said, please send your pre-approval letter if you would like your offer to be considered. And they never did. So literally I took those offers and I threw them in the trash can because I had nine other offers that had pre-approval letters or proof of funds with them. Why? Would I sit there and wait and wonder and be curious as to whether those two buyers could buy or not? I wouldn't. They're, they got one chance with me and they're gone and they never delivered and their offer was not considered because of that. So do yourself and your buyer a favor and get that pre-approval letter ready to go. Have it ready ahead of time and get it sent out. Anybody got any comments or questions yet? I need a drink, so I'm gonna give you a minute. Without those pre-approval letters, um, would you still have to uh, show it to your your clients? I did tell my client about the about the offers. I did put it in the spreadsheet that I made up for them, but I put a note at the bottom that said no pre-approval letter. Okay. And so basically, they had the same attitude that I did. You have nine with pre-approval letters and two that didn't bother to send it. They're like, well, I'm not going to take a chance on that. I got nine solid things right here you know they had the same opinion right. so um but yeah i did present them but there wasn't much point in me presenting them because right. they weren't they weren't being seriously considered and right. so your offer won't be seriously considered especially in this market it just won't be so get that pre-approval letter there and really that's to your advantage that gives you a way to talk to your client say listen if you want your offer to be seriously considered, we have to have the pre-approval letter. Let's get it in place before we go see this house because things are turning fast. I mean, it might just be you go see the house and they want the offers the same day at five o'clock and it might be a Sunday. And are you going to be able to get a hold of the lender at three o'clock on Sunday and get a pre-approval letter? Maybe, maybe not. And if you can't, then your buyer is stuck because they are not prepared. So, you know, use that as an example of how to encourage your client, get the pre-approval letter in place. I mean, back in the day when I was first an agent, I would show a house to pretty much anybody anytime because, you know, I, I needed the deals and um, it wasn't that common 15, 20 years ago to get a pre-approval letter before you had a house in mind. But now I'm like, you know what? If they won't spend 10 minutes and call a lender and get a pre-approval letter in hand and send it to me so I can vet it and make sure it's legit, then why should I spend hours driving all over the city showing them houses that they might not even be able to buy? So, you know, it's I've really kind of take a much harder line than I used to on that. And I would encourage you to do the same. You know, you got to protect yourself here as far as your investment of time versus what they're willing to do. So um, we're still stuck on here on the pre-qualification. So basically this paragraph says that if they don't provide that pre-qualification pre-approval letter within the stated time period, the seller can terminate this contract. They can just say, okay, you didn't send it in two days like you said you would, so I'm done and I'm moving on to another buyer. 
So I want to emphasize to you that this 3.2a, this lender pre-approval letter, this contingency upon buyer obtaining financing is what I call the first way out of the contract. So if you are looking at this contract at the buyer, they they might be nervous and they might be like, oh, I'm just not sure. You know, what if I get stuck in here? I'd change my mind or something's wrong with the house or something happens. I lose my job. I can't buy this house. I'm stuck. No, you're not. OK, because here is your first way out. And there's a few of them that I'm going to talk about. This is your first contingency. This is contingent upon the buyer obtaining financing. So the strength of that is in if your buyer cannot obtain financing, they lose their job, uh, COVID hits, you know, anything happens, there's a world war and they're called up, they're drafted. I mean, if for any reason your buyer cannot obtain financing and their lender will write them a letter to that effect, they can get out of this contract, no harm, no foul. And even if there's earnest money on the deal, they can get it back. So that's their number one first way out of the contract. Okay, so then we go to section 3.2B, which is a loan application. So I would never probably put a number bigger than seven in this loan application because there's really no need for it. I mean, these are calendar days. So maybe if it's you're putting your application, you know, putting your offer in on Friday, you might say, well, by Monday, if you get the contract by Monday, we're going to put the loan application in. So that's three days, four days. Seven calendar days is really a pretty long time. Most sellers are going to want you to respond a little more quickly than that. And if you get a property in contract with them, they're going to want you to apply for that loan immediately. So, you know, seven is the absolute max I would, I would ever put. I would normally put like four or five days in there to let the seller know that we're going to jump on this as soon as we can. And then, of course, the next blank is what kind of loan are you, is your buyer getting? And this should be specified on the pre-approval letter. Uh, if it's not, contact their lender or have them contact their lender and find out what kind of loan they're going to be applying for because that makes a difference to the seller. Um, we can get into that. It's a whole nother discussion about the different loan types and the strengths and weaknesses of each one and what they mean to the seller. But you need to disclose to the seller, if you're bringing a buyer, what kind of loan your buyer is going to be applying for. And then you also need to, under that section, inform the seller or the seller's broker of the identity of the lender. There's actually a form for that in the um, uh, Columbus documents on the dot loop. Or you can just use the pre-approval letter or confirm in email. It's usually done informally, but there is a document if you want to use that. And then notify the lender of the buyer's intent to proceed. And you would do that by sending the signed contract. Once the seller gets the contract, gets the offer, signs the offer, it becomes a contract. Then you would send that to the buyer's lender in order to indicate to the lender that my buyer is ready to move forward. So if the buyer doesn't provide this documentation, they don't apply for the loan, they uh, don't identify the lender, uh, if they don't comply with all these things in here, then the seller could have the right to terminate the contract um, because you didn't do what you said you were going to do. So any questions about that section right there? Anybody got any questions about this whole contingent upon buyer obtaining financing? If the uh, buyer was going to come in, say, with an FHA loan, and then they um, their lender said, well, we could actually probably do this conventional, um, is that going to cause you to write a new contract or... Um, I mean, do you have to do anything mm -hmm. special if the loan type changes? Good question. So if the lender changes, <clears throat> so like if you go, you're with West Banco and you got your pre-approval with West Banco and then you find out that, you know, uh, Kyle Dines and Auto Mortgage can give me a better deal, then you need to notify the listing agent that you're changing lenders. That can usually be done in a more informal fashion, like an email something that you can confirm that they got the information. But if okay. you're actually changing the loan type from FHA to conventional or vice versa, you actually need to do an addendum okay. to inform the seller 
the seller has to agree. Now, if you are going from FHA to conventional, that's typically good for the seller. Right. But if you're going from conventional to VA or USDA, especially, or, or FHA, that could be bad for the seller. That could be worse because- Yeah, the, because it could be appraisal or something like that. It could be a more stringent appraisal. Right. Uh, the appraiser could be looking at things more strictly that the seller might not be comfortable with. Right. So- if you are changing your loan type, you need to do an addendum, right? And that's why another reason why, you know, really having a good relationship with that lender upfront before you put an offer in for your buyer and having some conversations with them and making sure your buyer's having conversations with them about what is going to be the best case scenario to eliminate as many of those changes as possible after you go into contract. So, um, <clears throat> section... Okay, we pretty much covered all that whole section, the loan application, and if the buyer fails to do this, then the seller could terminate. The next section is a uh, loan commitment, and this is kind of a, a point that I've actually had a few discussions actually with Mark D'Andrea with and a few other people and with some lenders. So this is kind of a strategy, a strategy point here is what I would like to call it. Because a loan commitment letter is written by the lender. It's not something a buyer has control over, except from the standpoint that the buyer needs to be doing everything they possibly can to provide information to the lender so the lender can move the loan as long as quickly as possible. But the buyer can't write a loan commitment letter. The lender has to write a loan commitment letter. So when you put a number in here, uh, like there's a 30 in here right now, but if you would put another number in there like 10 or something like that, you're basically saying that within 10 days, the lender is going to be able to write a letter stating that they're committing to write this loan, to underwrite the loan for this buyer. And maybe they wouldn't be able to. I mean, everybody's situation is different. Every buyer's financial situation is different. Some are very complicated. I've had things fall apart two or three days before closing. Um, and it's not always something the buyer has control over. And it's not always something the lender can foresee. So this is the loan commitment section is something that you can add strength to your offer by putting a short number in there, like 10, but you want to make sure and you've had a conversation with a lender to make sure they can do that. Because if they can't, I want you to know that if the loan commitment, look down here under section 3.2C loan commitment, the second paragraph, <clears throat> if at the expiration of this period, the buyer has not delivered the loan commitment to the seller or the broker, the seller may terminate this contract pursuant to 3.3. So if you randomly put a 10 in there, and your buyer's lender is like, I, I can't do that. They're not ready. We've got this problem, that problem. I can't write a loan commitment letter. You just gave the seller a way out of the contract. And as a buyer's agent, that's not something you want to do every day of the week is to make it easy for the seller to get out of the contract. You're not looking out for the seller if you're a buyer's agent. You're looking out for your buyer. So um, it can be a strategic way to let your the seller know that your buyer is very solid and the lender is superhero like Kyle Dines, you know, and can get loans clear to close in nine days or 11 days or something like that. But if you're not in a situation like that where you're very confident of the buyer and you're very confident of the lender, then you want to be careful with this loan commitment day because you could end up uh, costing your buyer the contract if they can't deliver on that loan commitment in time. So just kind of a little warning, a warning there on that one. Anyone have any questions about that? I know there's a lot of different schools of thought on this. And, um, you know, if, if I'm a listing agent and I see a contract, an offer come through and it's zero in there, I will probably counter that number. But I'll be honest with you, most agents don't. Um, most agents are not sharp enough to understand what I just explained to you that their their seller it's a seller protection. This is a seller protection. As a buyer, I'm not a buyer's agent. I'm not trying to protect the seller. I'm trying to protect the buyer. 
But as a listing agent, when I get this offer in my inbox and I see they have zero calendar days, so they're not committing to a loan commitment at all prior to closing, I might want to counter that to protect my seller's opportunity to terminate the contract if the buyer isn't moving forward. But that's just one way the seller has of being able to be protected. And we'll talk about another one here in a minute. <clears throat> loan commitment. All right, next one is appraisal contingency. So this appraisal contingency is what I tell people is your number two way out of the contract. So appraisal contingency and loan contingency are closely tied together. If you, if the house appraises too low and you as a buyer don't have the money to come up with the gap to cover the appraisal gap, then obviously you can't get the loan. So that would kind of fall under, oh, my loan is contingent upon my financing. I can't get financing because the house appraised too low. So they're kind of tied together, but this is the buyer's second way out. If the house comes in, it appraises too low. So this, what this means, if you've never done a deal before or written a contract, that's, that's okay. So basically, if we are in this contract and we say we have agreed on $250,000 and when the appraisal comes back, the appraisal is done by the lender to protect the lender's interest. The appraisal comes back and it's only at $220,000. Uh-oh, we have a $30,000 gap. Now what happens? Well, there's a three different things that can happen. Basically, either the seller can lower the price to $220,000 and the buyer, you know, is all happy as they just saved 30 grand or the buyer can come up with $30,000 cash to bring to the closing to pay the gap or a combination of the two. So maybe the seller would lower the price a little bit. The buyer would bring extra cash to the deal. The $30,000 appraisal gap probably isn't going to get resolved and negotiated out. But if it's $5,000 or $10,000, you can almost always negotiate those out. The seller doesn't want to start over. The buyer doesn't want to start over. The buyer can sometimes borrow money from a relative with a, with a, a gift letter or something like that to bring extra cash to closing. I mean, cash in a 401k, uh, do something like that to bring extra cash. Or the seller may say, well, it's $5,000. I just, I just want to get this done. At that point, you're two or three weeks into the contract. Nobody wants to start over. So if the appraisal comes in low, you do your best to work it out. But if you can't, if the seller's not willing to budge, the buyer doesn't have any extra cash, there's just nothing you can do, uh, then the contract will terminate if you can't come to some sort of agreement on this. So that's the number two, buyer's number two way out. And that is a protection for the lender as well as the buyer. Any questions on that? Nobody? Well, look at all you people on the second page. Hi, Mark Hutchinson. I see you checking up on me there. If I don't do this right, feel free to chime in. Okay, we're going to go to the top of page third, uh, top of page three. And we are at about 10 minutes till seven. So I'm going to wrap it up here in the next 10 minutes. And uh, clearly we didn't make it seven pages, but... As some of you told me when we first got on here, this contract is complicated. There's a lot to it. There's a lot for you to understand. So we need to take the time we, we need to to understand it. So the top of page three, which is section 3.3, .3, is the demand for financing evidence. So this is a protection for the seller. So no, normally this doesn't happen. Very rarely does this happen. And the reason, the way you can keep it from happening if you're a buyer's agent is you can keep in touch with the lender and the listing agent. So if I'm a buyer's agent, I'm talking to my lender at least once or twice a week and saying, hey, how are things going? Did you get your loan app? Okay, we're through the inspection. When are you going to order the appraisal? So I'm keeping on top of the lender to make sure he's doing his job. And if he's a good lender, he's communicating with me and the buyer, hey, we just got through this part. This is good. Okay, you have conditional approval. And he's given me updates along the way. And as he does, I'm passing those updates on to the listing agent. I'm saying, hey, Mr. Listing Agent, this is where we're at. This is what happened. Uh, we got to this point. We got a snag here. I'm keeping them updated. And by keeping them updated, they don't get nervous. Um, I mean, they may get nervous if bad things are happening, but they don't get nervous because you're not communicating with them. 
And I'll tell you what, as a listing agent, that's what makes you nervous is when the buyer's agent stops communicating with you because then it just leaves you wondering and hoping everything is okay. And then if your seller comes to ask you, hey, how are things going? And you say, man, I don't know because the buyer's agent not calling me back. That's not good news. There's, that's going to make your seller nervous and it's just going to lead to a bad situation throughout the whole thing. But if the deal is languishing, if the lender doesn't seem to be moving on, if the buyer's dragging their feet, if you as the listing agent are just not seeing the progress that you're comfortable with and your seller is comfortable with, this is a protection for you. Section 3.3, demand for financing evidence. You, There are different... Um, different things you can do, different forms you can fill out. There's actually called demand for financing evidence. And you can present that to the buyer's agent and they have to give you some evidence that the deal is moving along. So, and if you, if they don't, if the buyer does not deliver this evidence to you in a timely fashion as specified in this contract, which I think is three calendar days, then you as the seller have the right to terminate the contract. So uh, that is a protection for your seller that I hope you never have to invoke. But if you do, it's in there. So if your seller is nervous and say, well, what if they just don't do it? Say, well, we'll do a demand for financing evidence and we'll get out of the contract. Because the last thing you want is for your seller to be tied up in a contract with no way out for 30, 45, 60, 75 days. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, they just keep dragging you along. So number one, you would have to do an extension to stay in contract that long because you wouldn't probably have your contract term that long. But even 60 days can be forever if you had a 60-day contract and the buyer is just not doing their job or the lender's not doing their job. This can help your buyer, your seller, get out of the contract. All right, section four, I'm going to finish up with this one. Um, this is taxes and assessments. So in the state of Ohio, taxes are paid a year in arrears. Now, if you own a home, you probably know that, at least to some extent. Um, if you had your taxes increase at the beginning of 2024, you probably know that, that in a painful extent, uh, because what happens is the taxes you're paying right now, like we just paid taxes in February, the taxes you paid in February 2024 actually paid the taxes for a whole year ago from 2023, from the first half of 2023. And so when a property closes, when a transaction happens, what ha what you do is you don't give the county your money ahead of time. They don't want it. So you can't just go into the county and say, here's next year's taxes. I'm paying them now because I'm selling my house. They don't, they don't want anything to do with that. They won't take it. So what they have to do is they have to prorate the taxes. So basically, the title company calculates this all out. They prorate it by day. They base it on the date of closing. So if you're closing on March 15th, the seller would pay all the taxes from the previous year that haven't been paid yet, plus everything from the current year from January 1st up to the date of closing on March 15th. And the seller would actually give the buyer a credit for all that money. So it might be several thousand dollars and it shows up on the settlement statement. It's called a tax proration and it is a credit handed directly to the buyer. Now, I always tell buyers if they were buying with cash, they should take that lump sum of money and put it in a savings account and wait for the tax bill to come next year and use the money to pay it because that is the money that the sellers owed in taxes for the period of time they owned the house. But the buyer has to hold it and pay the taxes when the taxes come due. Now, if the buyer's getting a loan, their, their lender will actually take care of that holding of the money. They'll collect that money, part of it, and they will hold it until those taxes come due the next year. But that is something that is very confusing for buyers and sellers to understand um, is how, how this whole tax proration happens. And it's because the taxes are paid a year in arrears in the state of Ohio. Do we have questions about that? You guys don't have very many questions. I wish you had more questions. <laughs> 
I'm getting ready to wrap it up here because we're approaching seven o'clock and I hear a thunderstorm coming. Um, and before I do though, I want you to scroll back. I'm going to scroll back through this and I want you to just prompt your memory or if you've written anything down, I want questions. I want to know uh, if I explained it well, if it makes sense. Yes. I had a seller that we uh, we closed on the house, and before the buyer moved in, she got a tax bill. <laughs> that was the weirdest one I've ever had. <laughs> that was just bad timing then, probably. It happened in yes, January that was or July. Impeccably bad timing. Yeah, so, and you can tell your buyer if they move in and they do get a tax bill, just send it to their lender because their lender will take care of that. But sometimes it does happen. The mail does a crossover like that. Yep. Anyone got any questions? Please ask questions. I know I didn't explain it well enough that you don't have any questions at all. <laughs> Justin, any comments? No, it's been great so far. Okay, cool. So awesome. Mike, I have a question. What when you uh when you go back to the buyer's realtor and point these things out and they are in the deer in the headlights look, how do you what do you do? What point what things out? Well, like when they when they have like a, a commitment or something that they've, they've not done and they've just ignored it and you tell them that the, the seller has the right that your client, the seller has the right to walk away from this because they didn't do this and they're way behind. What type of response do you get from the buyer? Say, well, I try not to let that happen, honestly. And, and, you know, I would encourage everybody communication is the key. Um, you know, if I haven't heard from the buyer's buyer or the buyer's agent or the lender or anybody like that, and it's been a, a week or 10 days into the process and maybe they haven't scheduled the home inspection um, and I haven't, you know, gotten any uh, thing from a title company or anything like that. If I've, if it's just been crickets, I'm going to be reaching out. I'm going to say, yeah. Hey, how are things going? So yeah. if I ever would do that demand for financing evidence, they wouldn't be surprised because I would have been bugging the crap out of them to try to get them to perform before I ever pulled that kind of trigger. Yeah. Just That's what I like courtesy. about it, our time management chart that we have in dot loops. That's a real yes. good, good thing to follow. It, yeah. It's just trying to get every the, the the seller's agent to fill that out and keep track of yeah. it and keep it in front of you at all times. Yeah. And that's what I do is I do the transaction checklist that's in dot loop and, yep. and I usually fill it out and then share it with other people in the transaction. I'll share it with the lender. I'll share it with the listing agent, share it with the title company, even though they don't really care. Um, but just so that it's yep. clear that this is the day we're expecting the inspection to be done. This is the day we have the loan commitment due, whatever they are, we're all in agreement on what those dates are. And yep. I put them I in my calendar and um, I encourage my buyer or seller, whichever, to put them in their calendar so that we're constantly being reminded of these timelines. Yeah, I don't put it in my calendar, but I keep that that management, that, that chart in front of me at all times. So right that's great. Yep. 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 I do exactly the same thing, Mark. That's a good comment. Anyone else? Any comments, questions? Okay, so I will be doing a residential purchase contract 102. Uh, probably in the next few weeks sometimes. And we'll pick up right here at the uh, very bottom of page three uh, with fixtures and equipment. Um, well, right there, 4.2, I'll get that. But uh, that's kind of minor. But um, I want you to write down your questions and I would encourage you to do a couple things. Get on Dot Loop or on the uh, Red One Agent Resources and get that list of clauses and look at them and read them and try to understand what they're for and when you might use them and write, jot down your questions that you have. I said, we'll probably do another class on that at some other time rather than, because we could just be forever on all these tangents on this contract, but then also read through the, the rest, uh, read through this, these first three pages again, read them word for word. If you've never actually read it, read it, read it a few times. Uh, because you need to be able to be comfortable explaining this to buyers and sellers alike. And you need to have the answers to their questions right on the tip of your tongue. If they say, well, what if it, what if it doesn't appraise? 
boom, you can tell them exactly what happens. This is what this is what we'll do. Re, we'll renegotiate. The seller will do this. The buyer will do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. And that's what we do. And you need to have those options right in the top of your tongue, ready to explain them to your buyer or to a seller, uh, either when they ask a question or when the situation presents itself. So read these over. Um, spend some time reading the next few pages. Jot down any questions that you have. I love interaction. Uh, if you catch me up on a question and uh, something I can't answer, that's why Justin and Mark are here and or we'll ask someone else if I don't know the answer. Um, so we uh, appreciate your time tonight. Thanks, guys, for coming out. Stay safe in the storms. And uh, please, if you uh, just want to email me, hit me up on Facebook, any questions that you have, I'd be more than happy to answer them for you. All righty. Thanks, Gina. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Bye.